Section 21 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 4, April 1901. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. Two Wrens. The house wren is one of nature's illuminated successes. It has been said that there is no second spring, yet today, July 20th, this bird is in the full glory of springtime melody. He sings from the top of a telegraph pole, the song caught up and repeated by some country cousin in the grove, a musical argument carried on all day long and left at night in the same unsettled state in which morning found it. Whether they are discussing the relative merit of their respective claims, a town residence or a country seat, I am unable to decide. It is certain, however, that the concessions of neither party infringe upon domestic dignity. Their speech is a revelation of supreme content, a liquid, flexible measure with ripples and cascades bubbling through and over a dash of pure color amid July's neutral tinted emotions. The day may be dark and threatening, the sun concealed in gloomy banks of cloud, rain falling or thick mists obscuring the valley, each and all are powerless to dampen his ardor or to affect his extreme optimism. He clings to his creed with persistent closeness, asserting valiantly the ecstasy of finding one's self alive and emphasizing this statement by a perfect wave of melodious argument. There are hours when he sings with such force that his whole little body catches the keynote and natural rhythm. The melody becomes compounded of his very substance, body of his body and soul of his soul. It is an inundation of musical notes, cascadic, cataclysmic, the tide of song rising till it drowns his personality he is no longer a bird, but an animated song. My little neighbor is a pattern of husbandly devotion, a lover husband, over whom coming events are already casting tender shadows before, the special event in this instance being located in a crevice beneath the eaves of the house. Wren babies had not left the first nest when Jenny Wren's husband was hard at work upon a second house, which was ready for occupancy before the first family were self-supporting. This was an admirable arrangement in the way of time-saving, as eggs are often laid in the second nest before the first is vacated. Though the new house lacked the freshness of coloring and the picturesqueness of the swing of a nest in the sunshine, Jenny Wren made no complaint of being cooped up in the darkness, and as to her husband, he was quite as well pleased with the glamour and wonder of its art as if it had been wound with blossoms and sprinkled with stardust. A bird with different tastes might have urged that it was only a little hole in the house jet, yet everything in life depends upon the point of view from which you regard it. Judged from the wren standpoint, it was considered admirably adapted to the family needs, nor could the most critical observer fail to see here a literal illustration of that familiar truth. Happiness is from within. Standing upon a ladder, I counted eight eggs as my eyes became gradually accustomed to the partial darkness within the nest. The dark, vinaceous spots laid on so thickly as to conceal or obliterate the original color, thus helping to hide them more securely. In the long brooding days, when Jenny's little answering heart is preoccupied and silent, the hours are sometimes long and lonely to her mate. At these times he has been known to devote his spare moments to building a nest simply for his own pleasure. Many instances of this remarkable habit are recorded of the English wren, 
the explanation offered being that the old nests are for the purpose of deceiving the parasitical cuckoo there is also a supposition that the bird's active nature finds relief in work being urged on by the increasing lonesomeness this wren trait reaches a climax in the marsh wrens with whom the building habit becomes a passion nor is it restricted to the wren family many instances being recorded where other species have beguiled the waiting days by an imitative housekeeping the house phoebe has been known to build a second nest while its mate was brooding to all appearances this was an instance of overdeveloped domestic tastes nor did the experiment end with the completion of the duplicate nest upon which the male bird sat regularly for several hours daily wrens do not take kindly to double houses their warlike nature seeming to revolt against living friendly with near neighbors a pair of wrens that was well established in an unoccupied martin house made it very uncomfortable for the later arrivals while the martins were abroad after material for the nest the wrens sallied forth in an utterly vindictive spirit and scratched out all their neighbors had constructed after singing a triumphant song with much parade they wisely retired to their own domicile to be on the defensive wiser wrens with an instinctive knowledge that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure are known to have the forethought when the box in which they build contains two compartments to fill up one of them thus avoiding the risk of troublesome neighbors wrens have been known to nest in a human skull others with less questionable taste have gone to housekeeping in an old boot a watering pot a coat sleeve in gourds and baskets jars and water pipes while another pair made a nest in the lower part of a stone vase in the garden there was a hole for drainage in the bottom of the vase and through this hole they found beneath some shavings a circular space just suited for a nest the vase was not filled with plants until the domestic affairs of the wren family were happily concluded the delicate swaying hammock of the oriole is sometimes used for a second nesting there was bitter disappointment in wren circles early in the season when with the presumption of inexperience the pump was filled regularly with coarse twigs which were promptly dislodged at nightfall undiscouraged at this defeat the morning hours were utilized for rebuilding with a persistency well worthy a more intelligent effort they worked and sang sang and worked until a cigar box was nailed to a tree for their special accommodation this was nearly full of twigs when they decided that the building site was ineligible a decision hastened by the fact that just at this opportune time a glass fruit can was left upon the piazza shelf no sooner was this glass house seen than its possibilities were realized and plans were quickly made for a kind of crystal palace experiment under other circumstances this might have been a dangerous precedent a certain unneighborly conduct toward their little brothers of the air had at various times fairly invited the throwing of stones the can was half full of tiny faggots and jenny was thinking of settling upon the mattress of wood fibre when the thrifty housewife turned them adrift summarily well aware that this kind of housekeeping within easy range of neighboring cats would not be successful before such supreme content who could have the heart to undeceive them and yet the can was turned upside down before they could be made to understand the situation like thoreau they did not wish to practice self-denial unless it was quite necessary after the failure of this crystal scheme it was a difficult matter for jenny to make up her mind as to a further preference but when she really decided it was with such entire good faith 
as left no doubt in her lover's mind as to her judgment this was more flattering as it was his own choice their last year's home thoroughly remodelled to which he had repeatedly called her attention vainly so the hole in the house jet at least answered the question where are the birds in the last year's nests for the wrens moved in regularly the tenor having a perch upon a projecting bracket where jenny joined him a regular little termagant scolding with all her might whenever the kittens looked that way marsh wrens small brown birds with barred wings and tail breed in or about the swamps and marshes of lake champlain they are intensely interesting from their habit of constructing several nests but one of which is utilized for housekeeping after the real nest is made and the first egg laid the male stays closely at home busying itself with building several nests which are to all appearances entirely superfluous in locating those he does not go beyond the immediate neighborhood of the true nest some have thought that these sham nests are used as hiding places for the male a lilliputian watch-tower or guard-house from which close watch is kept of the home property whether mrs marsh wren really needs such close watching being more inclined to flirt than the ordinary feathered spouse or because she is a better wife so infinitely precious that she must be guarded from every side is as yet an unsolved question love holds the key to all unknown and though there is little to admire in a deportment made fine by compulsory measures no doubt both parties understand the situation which is quite enough for practical purposes these nests conspicuous from their size and exposed position are securely attached to the upright swaying reeds some of which penetrate their substance they are lined with soft grasses and have an entrance at one side often nearer the bottom than the top mr burrows who has found the marsh wren's nest surrounded by half a dozen make-believes says the gushing ecstatic nature of the bird expresses itself in this way it is simply so full of life and joy and of parental instinct that it gives vent to itself in constructing sham nests the generous-hearted creature being willing to build and support more homes than can be furnished or utilized entering the lake shore drive at st albans bay where dense tangles border the swamp beyond you are sure to hear a song that is unmistakably rainish you have glimpses also of a small brown bird bubbling over with a nervous energy that betrays itself in every note he utters wait quietly and he approaches but go one step in his direction and he recedes to the swamp where human food may not follow push your boat up the creek the only avenue leading to his abode that tantalizing song leading on meanwhile like the pied piper of hamelin though unlike the latter there is no disillusioning at the end red-winged blackbirds take wing as you enter the twilight of soft green and amber shade and the far-off music of their jangle bells becomes less musical the males striving to recommend themselves by music like some awkward youth who serenades his mistress with a jew's harp and using the air or the alder tops as a parade ground upon which to exhibit their musical evolutions and yet you are witness to many a voluntary bit of sentiment that will increase your interest in this scarlet epauletted regiment descendants of the dusky tribe that anchored long ago in this peaceful haven going out and coming in with the tide until the legend of their coming is as vague and shadowy and misty as that of the golden fleece voyagers the argonauts they ebbed and flowed with the stream 
came at the proper time and season without knowing why, anchored and launched their ebony ships when it was time for sailing. Here and there along this waterway the branches clasp hands above the creek, forming an arch of green within which vines sufficiently elegant to warrant exclusiveness cling in unaffected grace to the alders without inquiring or caring as to the pedigree of their support. It is sufficient for them that the support is there. A whole half mile along the stream and trees and bushes disappear, leaving a dense mass of reeds, the marsh wren's own country, out of which he is never at his best, and to which he gives you no welcome. Birds like persons have wonderful powers of concentration upon one topic. Woe be to you if that topic happens to be yourself. Every denizen of the swamp regards you with suspicion, watching each movement as closely as if you were a dangerous character traveling under an alias, and could not be trusted to sail upon this ruddy ocean in which their lordships have anchored their private yachts. Push your boat far in among the reeds and cattails into the sea of shadows over which no sluggish current sends a ripple, and certain globular nests in the tangled reeds reward your search. Push your fingers within these nests, and in one only, here and there, will you find from five to ten dark eggs a rich reward for all your trouble. Meanwhile the neighbors, and the marsh wren generally has numbers of them, have doubtless been charming you with their bubbling, gurgling song, always half the colony singing at once, or one bird rising above the reeds gives the order, as it were, and the whole colony joins in the chorus. The song is quite beyond their control. They seem filled to overflowing with an inexhaustible supply of music, which trickles down the reeds like gathered-up drops of water charged with music. Quote, Sometimes, like a mine of melody, it explodes within them and lifts them from the dark recesses of the flags into the air above. End quote. Nelly Hart Woodworth. End of section twenty one. Section twenty two of Birds and Nature, Volume nine, number four, April nineteen hundred and one. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. When spring comes, again the birds will weave their nests and come and go on airy wing, and one will nurse her little guests, and one will watch and sweetly sing. The bushes small and towering trees, their leaves of living green will don, and swaying in the restless breeze will laugh because old winter's gone. George G. End of section 22. This recording is in the public domain. Section 23 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 4, April 1901. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. Cubebs. Piper cubeba, Linnaeus. Aromatics as cubebs, cinnamons, and nutmegs are usually put into crude poor wines to give them more oily spirits. Floya, the humors. The cubeb yielding plant is not unlike the pepper plant and belongs to the same family. Piperaceae. The two resemble each other in general habits in the form of inflorescence and in the fruiting. Cubebs were known to Arabian physicians as early as the ninth century, who employed them as a diuretic in kidney troubles. 
It was also known at that time that Java was the home of the plant. At one time it was believed that the carpesium of ancient writers was cubebs, but this is now generally disbelieved. Edrisi states that cubeb found its way to Aden about 1153. During the 12th and 13th centuries it was employed medicinally in Spain. Originally it was doubtless employed as a spice similar to pepper. Mariano Sanudo, 1306, classed it among the rare and costly spices. Hildegard referred to the soothing properties of cubeb. In the 13th century, cubeb is mentioned among the import articles of London. About the same time, it found its way into other European countries, notably Germany. At the beginning of the 19th century, cubeb disappeared almost entirely from medical practice. About 1820, English physicians of Java again began to employ it quite extensively. As in the case of black pepper, the fruit is collected before maturity and dried. The fruit is about the size of the pepper, but has a stalk-like prolongation which distinguishes it. The pericarp becomes much shriveled and wrinkled on drying. Cubebs are cultivated in special plantations or with coffee for which they provide shade by spreading from the trees which serve as their support. Their cultivation is said to be easy. Cubebs have a pungent, bitter taste and a characteristic aromatic odor. It cannot readily be confounded with any of the other more common spices. Its use as a spice is almost wholly discontinued. Its use in medicine is also waning, since it evidently has only slight medicinal properties. It is used in nasal and other catarrhal affections. Cubeb cigarettes are used in the treatment of nasal catarrh. It has a marked influence upon the kidneys, causing irritation and increased activity, and as already indicated, it is therefore a diuretic. It is, however, harmful rather than beneficial in acute inflammatory conditions of these organs. Albert Schneider End of section 23. This recording is in the public domain. Section 24 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 4, April 1901, recorded for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. A Treetop Town Before the cradled violets awake beneath the grass, or any but the crocuses and catkins have come back, always tis then the loveliest thing of all things comes to pass, a twit twit twitter on the mild spring breeze, a twit twit twitter in the leafing trees, through which small sky blue wings flash out a sky blue track. Four bluebirds, first adventurous house builders of the year, are at their old wise tricks again of settling far and near. Not long tis when the hyacinths and tulips bloom in rows, and lilies of the valley start to whitening on their stems, and woodsy things are opening fast to make a new outdoors. Then Robin Redbreast on a sunny day comes taking life his usual charming way, with a blithe and merry che che chem chem chems while yet dry leaves and building twigs are left upon the ground, I thought I'd come to the old place and take a look around. Then later, when the grasses curl a tilt in taller growth, and nooks for snuggeries are made by grape and ivy vines, 
when lilacs stand in purple and the plum trees blossom forth comes here a lilting gay and gaudy troop tits thrushes bobolinks blue jays with noisy whoop kingbirds wild tumblers in the air drunk with ethereal wines then cardinals and indigos and finches find the place and so the town site in the trees grows populous apace one waiting for the apple blooms is he who's always late the oriole his building site none e'er disputes with him though last to come he has full leave to settle with his mate and hang his hammock up to rock and swing to flout the town on breezy orange wing from where his house sways early adown a pendant limb and now the high green treetop town which welcomes every comer has settled to the business of singing out the summer austin arnold mccosland end of section 24 this recording is in the public domain end of birds and nature volume 9 number 4 april 1901